Catholics are, didn't you know that? And so it's using those sorts of examples to engage the local grassroots community leaders and to help them discover why they need to be interested and they need to be involved. So yes, leverage your way and leave me your card and I'll make sure my people talk to your people. Any other questions? Uh, the question is actually for uh, the law professor. Uh, in, uh, in Canada, one of the fundamental drivers has been that uh, the internet is a private sector led, multi stakeholder environment. We have a relationship with our government. Uh, I, as the CCTLD operator, uh, which we refer to as a collegial relationship, but our government has certainly, uh, uh, in our mandate, made it known that they don't really want to be involved in running the internet, that it is up to the private sector and with us in concert to make sure it works, that we do a good job, we have good governance, etc. I listened to your comments, which really called for, as I heard them, more government, uh, some would call it intervention, some would call it interference, some would call it participation. How do you reconcile your call for more government action in the administration of the internet, in the governance of the internet, with those countries who believe that the government should take much more of a hands-off role, should be there to make sure things don't really go wrong, but effectively let the private sector and the CCTLD operators and the multi-stakeholder environment drive the governance and the administration of the internet.
developing countries. Did you, did you have a follow-up on one of the win-wins of being involved as an at-large structure within the narrow remit of the ICANN world? When we recently had a change of government in Australia, and Australia has a, a, a soft policy link, a, a hands-off, um, it manages its domain namespace through the not-for-profit entity AUDA. Uh, but of course they can pull the plug should they get cranky with us at any time. And I'm saying us because I'm also a director of AUDA as an elected person from the demand side of the equation. But what was interesting is with the new government in Australia, uh, one thing apart from uh, national broadband networks they were keen to look at was the consumer input in the self-regulatory model for the whole of telecommunications in, in a converged environment including communications over IP. When they put a group of nine hand-picked leaders in community advocacy space together to work with and were facilitated by the government, and we've come up with a whole brand new model and a brand new n national entity for consumer issues to do with all communications, including naming and numbering and the internet. We looked at who had been selected, and from the at-large point of view within ICANN, the ISOC AU chapter is, at that stage, the only at-large structure representing our country. Of the nine people selected to make this happen, six of them were organisational or individual members in leadership roles of our at-large structure. And so what we have is, is an opportunity for things to also affect wider within country matters. And I, and I think that's where working with your local at-large structures could be quite interesting. And also in the new GTLD space, when you're trying to establish the bona fides or not of a claim of community support, we've got an ICANN vetted entity on the ground in an awful lot of countries who can assist as a friend of the court um, in those assessments. So there's a lot to offer. Um, and they're sort of the intangible win-wins. Any other questions? If Yes, go ahead, please. Microphone. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I've um, recently, as you know, I've joined a, uh, an organisation of consumers, and um, I've uh, brought up the possibility of us uh, becoming an at-large structure. And the uh, question that's been put to me is, uh, um, uh, it, this seems a bit off uh, topic for us. How does this really relate to consumers' uh, everyday lives? Um, so I, I suppose this is a question that's come up again and again. And uh, so I was wondering if you have like a, a, a top five list of, of issues that can turn the tide and, and get an organisation to see the benefit of becoming an outlier structure. And pretty much very, very boring pieces of uh, information you're trying to, to get out to the public. You need to find those leverage points like working with, and the one we're using, for example, in the Asia Pacific for our requirements to look at V6 transition from V4, is mobile telephone communications, uh, something that most of them know, want and desire. And all of a sudden you can start talking the green advantages of battery life saving and indeed uh, power saving within data centres in a less natted world. Makes sense to people. You just, you just find the leverage points and then they go, ah, light bulb, ah, I see why we need to be involved. Communications is fundamental to what we are that makes us human. And, and to be honest, Jeremy, I'd, I'd be going back to those original requirements when we came out and started to gesticulate and want to work with each other. It all comes down to effective, safe and understood communication. And in the converged world, a lot of that has to do with the naming, numbering and nomenclature on the internet. That said, once you're an at-large structure, you also then get to network with all the other at-large structures who are interested in spam, who are interested in all of those other things. It, it is more than just within ICANN. And interestingly enough, I'm now going to push the button and uh, say, in his thesis, <laughs> careful, Jeremy, you will be dealing with...
and questions in a moment. The internet and governance design, a governance network, internet governance reform by Jeremy Malcolm. He outlined some ideal criteria for governance network of the internet. These were an open and transparent forum, a multi-stakeholder composition, engaged in democratic deliberation, led by a multi-stakeholder executive body and with its representatives chosen by participatory means, and that ratifies the forum's decisions by consensus between the groups. What I'm here to say is that that is the at-large advisory committee and the at-large movement of today. What's happened, and I think it's timely that we're having this opportunity at an IGF forum to discuss it right now, is that during the 33rd ICANN meeting in Cairo, in November this year, and it was ratified at our November teleconference. November this year, our November teleconference meeting, the one part of Jeremy's ideal hit lists for effective uh, multi-stakeholder modelling of internet governance, which we didn't have within our part of ICANN, which is the at-large advisory committee, was that executive committee that was beholden to each of its regions. We've now ratified, and within the structure that is the at-large advisory committee, we have a powered executive committee and that executive committee has to be regionally balanced. In other words, the nucleus of workers within the at-large advisory committee who meet twice as often as everyone else does and manages the day-to-day -day requests and activities that come to us on many structures now is linked back to being there simply because the community has elected them to be there. Now, if we change regional geographic um, requirements and we end up with seven regions in the future, that doesn't change. We then have to have a seven-person executive. And it's within that that we look at the matters of language diversity and gender equity and all of the other equities um, that a proper, well thought out and effective multi-stakeholder model um, can look at. I'd also like to, in our uh, closing, and I'm uh, very aware that you're um, all going to need to go and stretch your legs and have a much needed break, um, is please take, this will be going, I assume, onto the website, so please take the time to read Grace Eyre's discussion paper on ICANN's multi-stakeholder model. I've put the URL into the document, um, and I'm not going to uh, read through this now, but what it does as, as a discussion and position piece is look at how ICANN has changed in this last, at the writing of this, it was nine years, now it's ten years, and how it's had to constantly evaluate and re-evaluate how it participates and how it engages with, in my situation of interest, the end user of the internet, which is not the business driven, not the contracted uh, party, and, and not the smaller micro business using internet um, as a tool, but ordinary mum and dad internet users, as well as the registrants. It's particularly, um, I think, important for us to look at her final statement, and that is, I'm going to read into the record. Out of the last nine years, the ICANN community has gained wisdom shaped by a shared history of successful management, endured difficulties, tested principles, and tried relationships, all of which have contributed to the development of a policy development paradigm that is extraordinary in its appropriate complexity and efficiency, even if, it, even if it will always be ever so incomplete. That the ICANN community reaches for it in the face of anticipated difficulty is a testament to the model's success, and I would insert not just the model's success, the willingness of the model to be modified as rapid changes confront us. It demonstrates ICANN's comfort with conflict, 
Well, certainly the at-large advisory committee has had its share of conflict and discomfort as well, and we're going through that with our current review. But what she is saying is they, and we are an integral part of ICANN, say, let's talk about it. That's very much what we're talking about when we're talking about multilingual internet, an internet of things, an internet that benefits each of us as end users. It's a transformative power of group in her view. And I thought it was timely that she ended up closing her paper saying, after all, today's internet has 1.2, now 1.3, billion users, and its explosive growth will undeniably continue but it will be in the hands of the stakeholders' ever-growing numbers that the internet will boldly go where it has not gone before, and it is our suggestion to you that one of the interesting observations that we could make is what we have changed in our last four years to the first version of an at-large advisory committee in its interim form, to going out and growing and encouraging wide global participation through our at-large structures and then our regional at-large organisations and then coming at the end of the Mexico meeting to our version 3.0, which will be a new mechanism, still an at-large advisory committee, but with much more change and possibly even much more real power in the multi-stakeholder model of grassroots input into policy development that happens in the world of ICANN. The portal for all things ICANN at large is there. Please take the time to have a look at it and those who have a technical bent will be delighted to know that it's a Drupal based system and it means that we will be able to have people just select their script and select their language. So we're designing things to be genuinely multilingual and I'd like to thank you all for your time and energy this morning. And uh, we are, of course, um, available for any conversations over coffee or in a, corridor, in, in a corridor. Thank you to my panel and especially to Hawa, um, who under enormous pressure from me um, has done a superb job in the language which she is not most comfortable with. And uh, I believe that we're all more than willing to uh, work together at the local level for the future of internet users. Thank you all. All of our internet connections have fallen out, so someone needs to tell them that
some of the main opportunities that digital education techniques present for really revolutionizing education, and then second, the real topic of this panel, some of the roadblocks that are really, that really make the expansion of digital education challenging. So there are four main frameworks, or four main opportunities that digital techniques really, really pose. And actually, before I list them, I'm sure that many of you are educators and have worked in these issues. And the reason that I'm trying to present this sort of basic framework is one of the real challenges, I think, as digital education is expanding both internationally and as new techniques are being developed, is the question of what we mean when we say digital education. Because I think the opportunities and the potentials that it creates are changing almost as fast as we can name them. So it's very important to think about what we mean when we're talking about digital education. So I'm going to try to give this brief framework. So there are four main opportunities that digital techniques pose or offer for education. The first is bridging distance and time. What I mean by that is digital resources allow you, allow educators to deliver content to students who can't actually come to a classroom, either because they live far away from any school or because they can't attend at the normal time in which the class takes place. This is one of the most fundamental changes that uh, digital techniques have brought, and as a classic example, you could think of distance learning. If you can't come to the classroom, technology can bring the classroom to you. Second, digital techniques can expand access to educational materials. So a number of, uh, many schools around the world have difficulty providing new textbooks and other resources to their students. There are many, many institutions that can't afford, for instance, to have a 50,000 book library or a very large research library but technology can provide access to these resources that the schools can't necessarily gain access to in standard print form. Third, digital education techniques can support new methods of teaching, can actually change the way that teachers teach. Because computers provide, or whatever digital interface you're using, provides new forms of interaction. It makes it possible for student-to-student student student conversations to take place, because the teacher doesn't need to be directly involved with every conversation in the class because the computers can provide mediation. It provides numerous opportunities for additional interactivity so the students can be more engaged and less passive. And it also provides opportunities for teachers to offload a lot of the work, such as some grading of exams, scheduling classes, administrative work that they normally spend a great deal of time on so that they have more time to do a teacher to student and then fourth and lastly, education and digital techniques can expand education beyond the classroom. And this is the newest or the, the area in which edu digital education is expanding the fastest. And what, it, what I mean by expanding education beyond the classroom is that it can bring education and educational opportunities to places where we've never imagined them before. Uh, one interesting example of this is uh, several news networks have started uh, what they call MOBISODES, which are short, four-minute uh, text me um, voice messages that will be delivered to people's mobiles. And it's a very short sort of plotted storyline. And each piece has a particular message or a particular educational, um, me educational lesson. One of the, one of the MOBISODES or one of the storylines is about the challenges that students might face if they move to a new country to go to school, the health concerns they might have in adapting to the new community. These are just ways that education can take place in places that we never imagined it could happen before. So these are sort of four things that digital techniques can really do to change the educational dynamic. In order to expand on digital education and make things possible though, there are several roadblocks, things that have made it more and more difficult for this expansion to take place. That's what we're gonna be talking about in detail today. And some of the other speakers will be able to talk about some of, these, some of the roadblocks that they have dealt with in their work in more detail, but I'm just going to give you an overview of the categories we're talking about. So first, there's economic roadblock, which really is simply that there's a fairly high startup cost to using digital education techniques at a school or at any institution, and that's that you need to provide the infrastructure and the network in order to use digital techniques. Now, that network isn't necessarily computers. It could also be cell phones. And one of, the, one of the techniques to deal with this roadblock is rather than developing an entirely new network, you sort of piggyback on an existing 
existing network, which is one of the reasons that mobile-based education, educational techniques have been expanding so rapidly. Second, there are cultural challenges, cultural roadblocks. What I mean by that is that digital education and the opportunities that it offers are look very different sometimes than standard education. And in order for a community to really leverage and take advantage of digital education, they need to recognize the advantages that it can offer. And if there's been no education about digital education, then the teachers in the community, the policymakers in the community, aren't necessarily going to know how to use it most effectively. So there are also these cultural challenges. Third, uh, there are technical challenges. And technical challenges, in some ways, sound similar to economic challenges, because what it means is you need to have the technology to make digital education possible. But there are multiple layers, because you need the skills, and this is a lot of what I refer to when I say technical challenges, you need the human skills to maintain and develop the technology. Because if, you, if a school gets a grant for millions of dollars, and they set up a beautiful new IT infrastructure, but they don't have anyone who's trained in maintaining it, then before long what they'll have is a, is a room of very expensive, very nice looking paperweights. So the technical challenges are one of the most important sort of long-term challenges that schools and other institutions need to be thinking about when they're developing digital education techniques. Uh, fourth, you have what we call institutional challenges. And what I mean by that is while, there, while training needs to take place in the community to educate people about the values of digital education, training also needs to take place in the classroom to educate teachers on how to use digital resources. Because technology, like anything else, it's just a tool. And if you don't have people who are trained in leveraging it and using it effectively, it's not going to change education and improve it. If you were to purchase an expensive digital whiteboard and put it in front of the classroom, if the teacher doesn't know how to use it and the teacher doesn't know how to make more interactive lectures, it's not going to magically transform education. So that's what we call institutional challenges. And then last, there are legal challenges. And what I mean by that is that the law can be constructed in a way that supports digital education or in a way that constrains it. And one of the examples I mentioned earlier
Now, if you're envisioning education and digital education in a very classical conception, <laughs> teacher and school, student and classroom mm -hmm. are very appropriate mm -hmm. it's very appropriate mm -hmm. now to describe mm -hmm. how the educational process works. Mm -hmm. But if you think about some of the new forms of education that digital edu digital techniques make possible. Uh, learning individually on the internet, and then this calls me community led. By the phone education from mobile phones that are delivered completely no, 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 unconnected no, 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 no. to a school of any kind. What happens is that these laws, they provide flexibility for education within a certain framework, but they you don't provide Michael. the opportunity for all these mm -hmm. new kinds of education. And these new kinds are really the ways in which digital techniques have in some ways the greatest potential. The opportunity to change what we can't get access to. So as the other speakers are, are talking, and I think you're discussing, just think about how scope plays into the hard issues. Where do we draw the line at what constitutes education and what doesn't? Thank you. And thank you, good morning. And I would like to, to uh, refer to the fifth roadblock that uh, Nathaniel mentioned, but perhaps I mean a roadblock that uh, touched the, the other aspect, the other challenges, economic, cultural, technical, institutional. And um, we, why would we strongly believe that the uh, like offers a, a great opportunity to increase the access to educational materials, and especially in the digital environment. When we, were, when we were talking about the digital education, um, we need to address or to take into account the fundamental challenges posed by digital technologies, but the um, uh, dissemination of power of internet, the great power offered by internet. And we have to think about how to deal with this, the convergence of all these digital technologies uh, to work in favor of, well, these different groups that we just mentioned. On the one side, the user, teacher, researchers, students, and on the other side, the uh, creator or, or the generators of, of content, being uh, authors, performers, uh, publishers, etc. Um, copyright laws are, uh, have been uh, carefully crafted, and I'm talking about them, including treaties in general, international standards of copyright. Um, to take into account the balance between all those interests. We have on the one side the interest of creators and the other, on the other side the, the public interest of well, access to information, education, uh, culture, etc. Um, the same, but the risk especially posed for the, the creative community uh, uh, are, are different, are worse, perhaps. Um, in that regard, I would like this morning to, to refer to three points. First of all, do we deal at a local level? Do we deal at international level? Do we think of exceptions, like Nathaniel mentioned, different stakeholders. Uh, well, um, we think that, well, based on the experience of the 19th century uh, international standards, essentially, I would like we think that uh, the opportunities offered by uh, certain treaties to let national legislators to decide based on the cultural, economic, and uh, social circumstances uh, of a given country to decide how to deal with uh, the different needs in the area of education, uh, and essentially now in the, in the digital era, um, are remain the same. Um, let me take the example of the WCT and WPPT, the Web Internet Treaty. These are the most recent treaties adopted by WIPO in the area of copyright and, and related rights. These uh, treaties um, 
establish certain rights for the creators, uh, the, the performers or the producer of phonograms. And on the other hand, the treaties also give a general rule for um, uh, member states, for countries, to decide, uh, to decide based on a, a basic rule, um, basic rule that is called the three-step test, to decide how to uh, deliver these flexibilities that you just mentioned. Um, this three-step test says that uh, we, when we develop a flexibility, an exception, a copyright exception, we have to think about certain special cases only. I mean, it has to be in certain special cases that do not uh, affect the normal exploitation of the work and um, do not prejudice the in legitimate interest of the authors or the, the creators, the, the publishers or the the content generation uh, generators. Um, one inter interesting point, uh, the second point uh, that I would like to, to address is the idea that um, perhaps I mean uh, uh, an international standards on exceptions, minimal exceptions uh, at the international level is the answer, especially for to address these challenges in, in digital education. Um, we, we believe that this is not the only solution. One size doesn't fit all. Um, as I said, uh, flexibilities are based on the social and economic needs of, of uh, uh, different countries. And that's why today, in the case of um, uh, exceptions for teaching purposes or educational purposes, we have to launch a um, stakeholders platform that will gather, on the one hand, uh, the um, uh, visual impaired community, international visual impaired community, and um, publishers, uh, collective management organizations, and authors to discuss, to um, analyze the issue, to uh, study, to consider the different path to follow, to open the access for uh, of, um, um, protected content to uh, this um, uh, handicapped community. Um, finally, I would like to, to um, refer to the importance of um, uh, in this process, we have to take into account that we have to, to transmit or to, to teach students, teachers, uh, researchers, uh, re the respect for intellectual property. We have to, to um, um, show the value of um, creative works with the, the widespread, uh, widespread uh, illegal downloading of music, um, film, software through uh, networks, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, systems. I think that this is the, the most um, urgent need. And 
awareness raising activities. I think that these are, are also essential. Perhaps, I mean, you didn't mention that in your in your um, roadblocks, in the, your list of uh, roadblocks, but I think that is, uh, this is uh, essential. And this works on both ways. I mean, first of all, I mean, to, to value the, um, uh, the creative contents, but also to elim eliminate sometimes this apprehensive um, um, attitude from uh, teachers, from uh, students, that sometimes think that uh, they are violating copyright by doing uh, what just one photocopy, for instance. So um, it's just to, to, to show about the um, respect for copyright, but also to show that there are flexibilities, that it's possible to use um, mm, materials within what is called uh, fair practice. Thank you. Digital technologies providing a new opportunity for education. It is changing the format of teaching and also increasing uh, the opportunity for people to access the teaching materials, exactly, uh, and particularly uh, textbooks. Uh, the copyright, as a moderator uh, mentioned, it could be a roadblock uh, for people to access education. In order to protect the people's essential interest to access educational material in the information society, it is important to craft a reasonable copyright policy that is really friendly for people to access uh, education. Um, and here I'm going to use a case that's recently been decided by a court in Beijing, China, uh, to demonstrate the dilemma of developing country um, in, in front of the conflicts uh, between copyright and ICT uh, utilization in education. Uh, the, the, the facts of the case is not complicated. New Concept English is a widely used English teaching textbook um, in almost all the Chinese schools um, at, at uh, uh, middle level, uh, I mean, at, uh, and the college. Uh, it's been widely used in schools uh, for classroom teaching by teachers. Recently, a very large English teaching school, New Oriental, which is based in Beijing, made a multilingual courseware out of the textbook. We understand that the courseware uh, is kind of a computer program uh, to teach the course uh, through this ICT platform. Uh, through the courseware, uh, and, and uh, a learner can listen to a teacher's reading of the text. At the same time, it can watch the transcript. It's a real-time transcript of the contents of the text. What well, is very normal format for teaching English in China? You listen and you read along. So actually, there are two soundtracks. One is the teacher's reading. Another is a reading along by the learner. And it is very interactive, a very popular multilingual courseware available in Chinese market. What I mean is that the courseware um, on the media of uh, CD-ROM uh, was sold in Chinese market. However, the copyright owner of New Concept English uh, which used to be uh, an English uh, expert based in London. Uh, he passed away. The copyright owner now passed to his uh, wife and the publisher. The copyright owner sold uh, the, the multilingual courseware producer for copyright infringement based on two causes of action. One uh, is the courseware is infringing the right of public performance. Um, the second, it is infringement against the right of production. Uh, these two course of action are very interesting, actually. According to Chinese copyright law, copyright owners does not enjoy the right of uh, uh, recitation. Uh, that, that's quite that's a little different from the Berner Convention. But our right of public performance can actually uh, embrace uh, recitation. Arguably, when a teacher is reading a textbook, it's kind of performance. Uh, I, I don't think this is uh, totally r ridiculous. <laughs> it has a logic behind this. The issue here is whether this kind of public performance of a textbook <laughs> through a courseware should be prohibited and uh, categorized as infringement to the copyright. It's very arguable. Um, and second course of action, the right of reproduction is really critical and crucial for this digital education. What else this could be? If this is textbook, in print media, I read through the text. And now I can read the text on the screen. 
So what is the substantial difference between the screen showing and reading uh, of a book? Uh, they're all interesting issues. Then here, uh, we know the two calls of action. Uh, look at the legal analysis uh, of the case. Um, first of all, we should look at whether there's uh, limitations or exceptions for teaching use and the Chinese copyright law. If it's available, if it could be exempted from liability, that would be good. However, uh, this is really unfortunate. Under the Chinese law, there is only one provision on uh, educational use of copyright material, but its scope is really limited. Uh, it could be translated as follows. A uh, teacher can translate or making a few copies uh, of a copyright material for classroom teaching. So that's all. If it's for this purpose, then it's exempted from any liability. They don't need to get permission from copyright owner and don't need to pay to the copyright owner. Then look at this case. First of all, it's not a translation. Uh, the, the textbook is in English. Uh, the media, uh, multimedia courseware is also in English. It's not been translated into Chinese. Um, uh, another. Um, but, uh, but look at another elements that make a few copies uh, of the copyright material. That will be uh, controversial. Uh, the multimedia courseware is being sold in Chinese market. It's available uh, in, in hundreds of thousands of copies to Chinese readers. It's not a few copies, it's a lot of copies. <laughs> and, and thirdly, whether it is for classroom teaching, it's kind of self-learning. It's different from traditional classroom teaching where people get in the hall and teacher are reading the text. It's different from that. As we moderator said, it's new format of teaching. All interesting things. When we look at the, the single provision in Chinese copyright law, we can see a lot of problem with respect to um, a, a pro-education copyright policy. First of all, it's extremely limited and you can see it's limited to translation and limited reproduction. And, and secondly, it is category specific limitation and exception. It's limited to translation and reproduction, not any other kind of copyright utilization. Uh, there must be uh, more than 17 categories of copyright use um, of a work, uh, such as uh, making a move of a copyright work. Can that kind of adaptation be included? Um, it's not clear. And certainly we can see this kind of uh, provision uh, in the law is very much from the perspective of copyright owner. Uh, the purpose is to limit this kind of uh, use of copyright material. It's kind of prevention of people uh, to go on the line. So they draw a line between infringement and non-infringement, but what they really care about is not let people to go uh, against the line, to, to go beyond the line. Uh, so these three things make this kind of uh, exemption and limitations are not really available for most kind of uh, digital education. So uh, we can see big problem here. Then we go back to the two causes of action how to handle this case has been decided. First of all, uh, with respect to right of public performance, the court decided this kind of a normal use of teaching material. Oh yes, of course, it's obviously normal use in digital environments through multilingual, uh, um, through multimedia platform. It's, it's equivalent to traditional classroom teaching. This is very, very important recognition of the status of this multimedia multimedia digital education. So for the first course of action, it is not infringing for this normal use for the educational purpose of educational material um, and to learners. The second course of action, right of reproduction, the court um, uh, recognized this is reproduction indeed. Um, the, the screen showing of the context of the text is reproduction. The issue here is that it's infringing. Um, the court believed in order to really facilitate the digital education and make people to access this education material, uh, it is necessary to interpret that copyright law provision um, broadly. So this kind of reproduction even is go beyond the, the copy limits, it's go beyond the traditional uh, media limit, it could be permitted. Uh, so actually the court rule in favor of the, of, of the producer of this multimedia courseware. 
Uh, however, the case still open um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of new issues in Chinese copyright law. And first of all, is that how can the copyright law be adapting to a new communication environment? Um, uh, like in this case, uh, the, the teaching material can be made available to the people through a digital media and through this uh, multimedia uh, uh, platform. And, and secondly, is that how can China, which is now being sued by the United States, this WTO, for the failure of copyright enforcement, uh, to really uh, effectively and reasonably uh, implement uh, its international obligation on copyright protection? Uh, thanks to uh, Madam Lom's very interesting presentation, now we are fully aware that it is very possible uh, it is very reasonable for a member state of Berner Convention to draft a uh, copyright, provi uh, copyright provision that is really commensurate to its uh, cultural, economic, and social status. They have the wiggle room to do that. Then why didn't China do that? Why uh, doesn't China do that? Then I draw, I'm, I'm leading that question to my conclusion. I hope the uh, WIPO and other international um, forum can really provide help to those developing countries um, who have serious concern about a copyright policy, but they are uh, sort of deterred from drafting a really pro-education, pro-access copyright policy for fear of being sued or punished by the international treaties. Um, and especially in this new communication environment and under the, uh, uh, the, the new uh, requirement from WCT and WPPT. Um, if the WIPO uh, 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 could provide some uh, guidelines or guidebooks for developing countries, they know that they do have the flexibility and wiggle room to draft this kind of uh, law or uh, provisions. It would be really helpful uh, for their law enforcement. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I have to admit that we have speakers who are particularly appropriate to this panel because you have to be a good educator if you can make dry details of copyright interesting and <laughs> get people to listen. Um, I, w I, found it, I found it very engaging. My topic is very different. Um, as we are uh, addressing today the particular challenges to digital education, to online education, platforms, access, technology, openness, everything that Nathaniel uh, outlined for us. We are addressing myriad new concerns that have arisen with these opportunities. The advantages bring the disadvantages. And I'm going to talk about something Nathaniel very kindly introduced for me. Um, the obstacle that teachers must adapt and take proper advantage of these new tools in order for them to work. He pointed out that an advantage of digital education is that it will bring out new possibilities, new techniques, new ways of teaching. This can, this will, and has already happened. However, we need to make sure as teachers, as the hum human component that we are, that we also change with the times, that we adapt, learn, and use these tools appropriately. Uh, for instance, Nathaniel mentioned that as teachers we have the advantage that we can offload many of our duties because we're letting the computers take over our, uh, some of the more technical or more administ administrative duties. But there is a very, very real danger, I can tell you, because I've been involved in online teaching programs that have offloaded too many of the duties where we're letting the program, we're letting the text do the teaching, the teacher is relegating its, its, his duties and it, it is not, it, it then ends up with a net loss in the teaching experience. I am, as you may have noticed by now, primarily in education, I, I am an educator. I'm, I'm one of those people they're talking about when they say if you can't do, teach. Well, I teach, I can't do. I think education is about learning, and then about teaching. But when I say this, I am not belittling, belittling myself or others in, in my position. I think it's a worthy talent. I think it's an important talent. And more so now, since the knowledge is so readily available and the application of knowledge, the use and creative manipulation of knowledge become more important. So teachers are important, and those of us who can teach 
I'm, I'm sure you've all had a teacher who knew everything about a subject and did not have the skill to impart that knowledge. Teachers have a valuable skill, and um, we need to exercise it. Education used to be about content, about teaching facts, and then about teaching knowledge. For some important areas, it still is. However, if content and the teaching of facts were the only or even the most important part of education, there would be no possible uh, justification for a first grade teacher needing a master's degree to get a job. Obviously, there's another component in here that is not the content of a first grade curriculum. Uh, taking this towards digital education, much traditional, uh, if we can say there's a tradition by now in digital education, um, the first applications did have emphasis directly on content and almost exclusively on content to the point of being almost programmed learning. I don't know, uh, can you broadcast the first uh, slide which gives you the, the very simply, very basically, uh, is it up? Okay, we, yeah, I don't, I don't know if they can see it though. The traditional classroom, of course, is teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student. And that's the, the way we all, well, at least those of you who are as old as I am, that's how I learned, um, in that one relationship. Then we moved on to the situation, if I can go to the next slide, please. Um, which were the first online courses or multimedia courses that I took they had their emphasis was still on content, almost exclusively on content, to the point of being almost programmed learning or self-learning, which was done almost completely by email or computer to multimedia. Uh, so this was not teaching and learning, but it was a multimedia digital experience. In my experience, the next step was a kind of online tutoring involving a teacher and a student. So in the same situation, we're still talking a student with a computer, but where the teacher is one teacher to one student in a tutoring context. This then developed into classrooms, and if we can go into the next slide, which, however, were essentially learning in parallel with one teacher uh, can we go to the next one where we're, yes. At this point, we, were, we started uh, defining larger classrooms, but with no particular relationship between the teacher and the students. From there, we went on to defining, uh, for instance, I took a graduate courses with one teacher, one professor, and many students, but if, can we go to the next slide, please? But all of the interaction was between the teacher and the student, the teacher and the other student. Every, there was no cross uh, communication from student to student. It was the teacher teaching a classroom, a classroom of students using a variety of online internet and online and multimedia tools. So then we have learning in parallel with one teacher, many students, but made up of many teacher-student relationships, not a class dynamic. So at this point, we've still taken a net loss from the traditional classroom where we have movement between the students. Uh, however, perhaps the teacher is now playing a more active role in, in feedback. So only when platforms that have been designed that allow not only for teacher-student, but student-to-student -student active dynamic interaction does learning that stimulates the maximum learning and creativity start to take place because now the toolbox or resource, resource pool is expanded to include the experiences and strategies of all of the participants, allowing for a juxtaposition of ideas that are directly applicable to the students' needs and comparable situations as they ex take their text and their basic material and add to it with each of their uh, experiences. So now for the first time in this diagram, and this diagram is why I bothered to do a simple PowerPoint, is because there we finally do have a dynamic movement that we have added to uh, the, the previous experience. The students now become active, as, as active almost as the teacher. Text and facts fade into the background as access retrieval and analysis become more important than memory. 
how to use the information, how to combine and recombine for new uses, discoveries, applications, and innovations is now the key. The information is available. Different looks, ways of looking at it, organizing, and using it combined with real life, real time use is the significant new value added from online and uh, digital learning. This is available with many online tools such as forums, blogs, mailing lists, social networks, hypertext annotations, chat, and both synchronous and asynchronous tools that we are using in the classroom. However, the teacher as facilitator, moderator, interviewer, and motivator still has a primary role in the classroom. In grade school, in high school, or in college, many of you will recognize that you had an experience of a great teacher who changed your life. Students online still need this relationship with their teachers. Even more than ever, they need the stimulation because they're a student alone with their computer. It's hard to keep your motivation up. It's hard. You don't have eye contact. You don't have nonverbal communication. You don't have a classmate or a teacher knowing whether you showed up for class or not. The, the onus is so directly on the student. And teacher, as teachers, we cannot forget that we have a responsibility there that we cannot relegate. The computer does not take over that stimulating, motivating role. Uh, just because we're teaching online does not mean we no longer need to care. It doesn't mean we don't need to interact to help a student through a difficult week or a difficult time and motivate them to, yes, you can do it, come back, or have them tell us or care. I have seen that many online teaching situations, the student never shows up again and no one even notices. That's not part of teaching. So we, if we want to have a net uh, increase in value and dynamic participation where we have no visual touch, we have no nonverbal cues, we need to find as teachers, as educators, other tools, other ways of communicating directly with our students to change and develop this role. This system was, has been, I, I mentioned that I'm uh, working with a wonderful group of Indian participants for a capacity building program um, working up to the IGF. And uh, we were very, very lucky to have a group that was able to be very dynamic within themselves, sharing the lawyers, sharing with the social activists, sh sharing with the technicians, filling in in the overview, because it is an, it's a capacity build, building internet governance course. It's not in depth. It does not replace an academic situation. But it gives an overview and fills in for anyone working in one area to see what's going on. So in this case, the student-to-student -student relationship is extremely important in order to add the value and the experience and dynamic of every single student. This then is the teacher's role, to make sure that the students to ask a question here, to direct a student to answer a question, to keep the ball moving if we're going to